Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Welcome to a conversation on island cultures and environmental leadership. Welcome to the Native American Cultural Center, our indigenous home. I'm Karen Beastman, director of the center and associate director and lecturer in Native American studies. On behalf of my colleagues, Greg Denny Woodward in the NAC, what we're affectionately called, welcome to our home. I invite our Pacific Island students to offer a warm welcome as well. Aloha o mahina poi poi o hua pia ka o mea ke ia no kaua kaniko o he e ia mahalo no ke ia hiki ana mai e na kumo. Aloha o John Arlo Ube Rodriguez kuma kuaane o Rina di Tishkam on Pala Maher Lada Rodriguez kuma kuhine no hupalala hana uia o Josiah Jose Kirni Juan Rodriguez o Lala no Kela mahalo no ka o Lala mai. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we have a lot. <laughs> Thank you, students. I also just want to give a personal um, gesture of gratitude to Celia Price, who so masterfully created this event and worked with us so closely over the, the weeks to make this happen. So thank you, Celia, from Conference Services at the Woods. We appreciate it deeply. Um, it's my honor to introduce our distinguished authors, but first I want to recognize the leadership of Chris Field, director of the Woods Institute for the Environment, and the Melvin and Joan Lane Professor of Inter Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies, Professor of Earth System Science, Biology, and a senior fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy at Woods. Thank you and welcome, Chris. Thank you, Karen. We're honored to be able to share this event with you. Wonderful. Oh. On to the show. <laughs> Peter Vitusik is a dear friend of the Stanford Indigenous community. In fact, he's family. He is the Clifford G. Morrison Professor of Population and Resource Studies, Department of Earth System Science, and Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. He was born and grew up in Hawaii and has been on the Stanford faculty since 1984. His research interests include evaluating the global cycles of nitrogen and phosphorus and how they are altered by human activity, determining the effects of invasive species on the workings of whole ecosystems, and understanding how the interaction of land and culture contributed to the sustainability of Pacific Island societies before European contact. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was awarded the 2010 Japan Prize. He is the co-director of the First Nations Futures Institute, where generations of his fellows have joined us in this very space for knowledge sharing, storytelling, stew, and music. <laughs> memorable uh, journeys together we've enjoyed, and of the Hawaii Ecosystems Project. Dr. Kamana Mayakalani, or Kamana Beamer, is a new friend <laughs> of the Stanford Indigenous community. He is a full professor and the inaugural Dana Naone Hall Endowed Chair in Hawaiian Studies, Literature, and the Environment at the Hawaii Inui Akea School of Hawaiian Knowledge at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. 
He serves a dual appointment in the William S. Richardson School of Law as part of the Ka Huli Ao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law. We are honored to host both of these distinguished scholars, authors, and community advocates. Welcome. We come from one common set of kupuna, or ancestors, and then as we sailed across the vast Pacific and inhabited our islands and, and created these intimate place-based relationships and, and stories and myths around it, it turns out you're going to make decisions that we would say are more sustainable in the long run. So if our kupuna figured out how to survive, and not just survive, but thrive for centuries in the most remote islands on the planet, <laughs> there's something to be gained there if we think about you know, this term sustainability really being about people and, and planet thriving and surviving into the future. My area of focus and study is principally uh, inspired by the aina. It's often translated, aina is translated as land. The literal meaning is that which feeds. So that's a pretty good indicator in terms of how we might see land differently. I was born and grew up in Hawaii and have done most of my research there since 1984 and have worked to bring together strains of understanding in my research over that time. I think there are features of Pacific indigenous societies that lead them towards sustainability. The first is that they're island societies. And so people could see when they were using up the land, using up the resources, and they could see that what was left was all there was or ever would be. When we think about island earth, we understand today because of the things that have brought us to climate crisis, the interconnectivity of the whole Earth, Earth as a system. Not Earth as, as separate, distinct continents that, that don't have <laughs> impacts on each other. I mean, we all, we all understand that very acutely today. Genealogy was really important in those societies, and so that enforces a long-term perspective. People see themselves as links in a chain that reaches far back into the past and far forward into the future. Beyond sustainability is, is kinship, you know, between people and place. So I think even from a scientific standpoint, it's okay to play in this space and say that having kinship relationships with our natural world, with our resources, what many indigenous people call around the world Mother Earth, and applying those kinship relationships when we make decisions about our social systems, our economic systems, um, our systems of governance, can have radically different outcomes than, than the ones that we've inherited today. An important feature of the book is to draw on both science as it's conventionally understood and indigenous understanding of the world. And tried to bring them together, not integrate them, because I don't think they can or should be integrated. I think that the right pathway is for them to look at the world together and learn from each other's insights about how the world works. That's the confluence we're seeking. Many of these, these principles are embedded, you know, at least from my perspective, in, in our ancestral ideals, in, in aloha aina, in love for that which feeds. Even if the academy was able to solve for climate crisis and sustainability without engaging indigenous systems, there would be so much that's lost. I just hope this book can, can help to advocate for recognizing our ancestral systems as needed and, and viable solutions for the multiple crises that we face today. Una una ita hala me talehua, e hala lehua no ina tanoe. 
ta uno i ano inei teili ane ho i o ta hiti mai. A hiti mai no oko, a hiti puno me te aloha. Aloha e. Aloha e. Aloha e. Aloha mai kako. No leila nui ko uhau oli e noho nei me oko malalo kia malu. Oka Native American Center. Ame kia po e pua a Hawaii e ho'olauna mai i a mako nei e ho'owehe ho'ola'a kia kahi a kako no ho'olauna nei. Mahalo nui. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you folks. Mahalo to Peter and the Native American Center here for hosting us. Um, I definitely had my best mutton stew of my life in, and fried bread in, in this exact room. Um, so many good memories, and I'm salivating just recalling them. Um, and so, yes, I, I, I just want to honor um, all of the students that are here, um, our Haumana of Hawaii that opened this space, and, and want to congratulate you and um, you know, another successful year and um, looking forward to all the incredible work that you'll do back at home for our communities, um, which is so important. Um, I also want to, you know, for me, uh, if you ask some of my teachers in grade school, they may have not predicted I'd be at Stanford doing a book talk. Um, <laughs> and so I really want to honor um, you know, I'm the first PhD in my family, not because I'm the smartest, um, but because I had incredible mentorship and, uh, and support. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry, unexpected. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to thank my grandmother, uh, my dad. So many incredible mentors that um, enabled this to happen. Uh, some of them that are not here, but incredible warriors for our Aina, um, Uncle Calvin Ho, Anakala Edi Kana'ana. Um, I want to thank my, my incredible people of my generation, um, Kaneko Schultz, Kili Kotubete, um, Kavika Winter, just incredible people that are out restoring our lands and our Aina. If you come to Hawaii, one thing that's very different from when I was a child is, is we have restored fish ponds. Um, our ancestral agricultural practices are not only feeding people, but they're inspiring a generation of educators and, and your, our youth. Um, we're advancing issues in policy and state government that are helping to um, uplift our ancestral practices in ways that uh, didn't exist when I was a kid, and so that's super inspiring, and I want to thank them. Um, you know, our, our, I want to thank my Wahine Kili'i for, for joining me here today. She's um, got so much to juggle with her work and everything she does, and just to make the space to be here together is awesome. Um, and <laughs> um, there's so much to say. So. Yeah, it's an incredible privilege and honor to, to be here. Um, our, our world needs indigenous knowledge systems. Um, it's unfortunate that at times we, we have to block roads and construction sites for people to see and hear us. Um, so for me, the work is it's in the academy, it's on the streets, it's... Um, in the centers of governance and, and lawmaking. And, you know, and, and now it's in Yale Press. And, uh, and so if it wasn't for all these people around me and then us and the generations prior, this, at least for me, this book wouldn't have been possible. Um, and it's important, I think, for the next generation to understand that 
again, these aren't just possibilities. They're, these are viable solutions for our future. And, you know, our world is in a hard and difficult place because of the policies and the decision-making and extractive nature of our economic systems and structures. And, um, and we have hard decisions to make. But uh, if we can be, <laughs> carry that aloha and grace of our ancestors, and um, if we can be fearless with vivo ole, uh, and, and trust that you know, our solutions aren't for everything, but together with the best practices of the day, we can solve the crises that we face. And, um, and so I just want to end by thanking Peter um, and Pam. It's been a, an amazing uh, journey and, and relationship um, through First Nation Futures Program, getting to work together with Peter and to present. I've learned so much about systems and uh, evolution <laughs> and ecology and biology and in working with Peter. Um, it's enriched and enlightened my world and my students in ways that my own perspectives wouldn't have. Uh, and, um, and with COVID, there were a lot of times we have four kids, um, five on the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so COVID was chaotic, and there were times I thought, can we possibly do this while everyone was at home in online school, and I was just running IT for my whole home. I swear I was just troubleshooting. Um, and Peter held it down, you know, and it was such an incredible collaboration to do this together. And, um, and so mahalo nui, Peter, for all your work that you've done for Hawaii, um, here at Stanford, opening doors to so many um, indigenous students that are now doctors. <laughs> and, um, and thank you, everyone. Mahalo nui. Thank you, Kamana, and I wanted to thank the Native American Cultural Center, Greg and uh, Karen. Karen, of course, <laughs> and uh, for everything you've done for us over the years and for what you're doing now for us. And I want to thank Chris and the Woods Institute, and I want to thank uh, Keone and Mahina for their opening of this event, which was beautiful. Thank you was great. And before I go on, I want to say that, uh, you know, I think that what we're doing in this book is obvious to people who live in their cultures. And they, they see the results of what we do and say, well, I knew that. Yes, and they did know that. But uh, the world didn't know that. And the world needs to know that. And so I think a lot of the time people know the answers from their life and their culture, but they don't know the questions. They don't know what questions the world has. They don't know what's interesting to the world. And that's equally important to knowing the answers. You have to know what you need to say. Um, and I hope we've said that here in collaboration because it's been wonderful to work with Kamana and with Semai Ritao and with Kavika Winter, and with many of the other authors of this book who've been involved in uh, living their cultures, we involved in Aloha Aina in a significant way. And so I want to thank you for everything you've done to make this world work. And I think that the world needs what we have to say, and I hope it will make a difference. Thank you. Well, I think you know we decided to write the book as a collaborative effort because you know it, it was clear to all of us that uh, it was time for something like this to be said. Um, there are now a lot of world-class native scholars in Hawaii and Aotearoa. And this book was intended to give them a voice. And they have a voice. But 
I think that these topics are something that they haven't been saying enough, and this is an important thing to say. Yeah, yeah. I, um, you know, I, th I think the years of collaboration of First Nations Futures Program, um, working and being challenged by our Maori cousins, and um, want to honor and, and aloha te maire for all his contributions, um, and and I think. In many ways, the synergies of convening here at Stanford um, really, really helped to um, be the impetus for for what became of, of this book and project. And um, you know, uh, working with Peter, uh, I'm a mahi ai. Although I'm a professor now, and it feels like I have less and less time to grow food. Um, one of my my true passions. Uh, other than being a pyromaniac and loving to burn things, uh, <laughs> is is growing food and and you know restoring loi systems, um, and so I worked alongside Peter, and um, you know, yeah, farming taro, opening up places, and and again thinking about these systems and these uh, relationships. Uh, you know, I remember Peter did a study looking at our our loi system and complex to see. You know what? What's regenerating the the soil? Is it is it nutrients coming from the water? Things that are breaking down, or or is it the mulching and and these interactions? So I think all of those, you know, collaborations really helped. And then um, Pam and all these amazing scholars here and and across Hawaii, you know, were able to take it to new levels um, in in the book and the project. So pretty cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't necessarily start with that plan, but but where it landed after years of collaboration is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that there's um, there are things here that uh, the world needs to know, and I think uh, the last chapter of the book, especially, you and uh, K. O. Duarte said those things. You know, that people who wrote this book, like Kamana, are living in between worlds and so have a voice in both of the worlds they live in. And that voice is crucially important to the world as a whole because of their positioning between worlds in what they, in how they live and what they say. Well, I'll start by um, con making a confession or disclosure. Um, my friends in high school, um, in our, in a dorky, geeky way, um, each chose countries to be. And then, uh, I don't know really what, after that, but then started to compete with one another, <laughs> citing the attributes of the countries. And I was invited late to it. So, you know, all the good countries have been taken, like United States and Russia and things. <laughs> and so I said, I'm gonna be the island nations of the world. <laughs> so it was a bit of a hack because, you know, that's more than one. I even said, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll concede that Australia isn't an island. Uh, um, but so if, if I look at the title and it's islands, um, you don't, um, in the title, restrict it to Hawaii. How much of the balance of what you study is Hawaii versus the other um, islands? And I suppose the best answer comes from looking at the book and reading it. <laughs> but, Maybe you could say a little bit. Uh, is there and is there like a, even like a, comparing? You know, if there's mm -hmm. good to be learned, is there better within them? Like iron sharpens iron. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I think I think so. I think that uh, you know we do have a lot of Aotearoa or New Zealand involved in the book as well. Many of the authors are from there, and uh, there's a chapter on. Papua Nui or Easter Island and the chapter on Tikopia in the Western Pacific. But I think we're pretty confined to the youngest islands, the most recently inhabited islands in Polynesia, and not islands in general, but Eastern and Southern Polynesia in particular. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that that's useful for the world to know. But I think that um, it would be interesting to go more broadly. The challenge now is that there are lots of 
world-class native scholars in Hawaii and Aotearoa. And there aren't that many in many places. And so you need those people to communicate what the cultures, to be able to explain the culture to the world and the world to the culture. And without that, I don't think you can um, really do what we need to do here. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I echo that. Just great collaboration. And uh, clearly, you could do other books focusing on other islands, and, um, and that is yet to be done. But I think this was uh, the lowest hanging fruit, given the resources and, and the work and the relationships that we had. Um, to be able to tell, I think, this, this very important story um, that, that you know, impacts a global audience. So, um, but yeah, well, you know, um, maybe it's the first of multiple projects. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looking more at islands in depth. So. Other yeah. people will have to do some of those. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations again on the book, and thanks for joining today. And, and sharing some of your thoughts. I, I, I would love to hear a little more about a uh, theme that runs through the book and, and was really prominent in the video of the nature of the juxtaposition between traditional and mm. Western knowledge and, and how they can complement each other without having to say exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if you can provide some of your thoughts on how you bring traditional or Western knowledge or and Western knowledge mm -hmm. to, together in ways that, that work for each of you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to start on that? Go ahead. Sure. So, <clears throat> you know, I think this is really important and critical. And, um, <coughs> you know, it, it's, not, it's not about establishing binaries or, or reinforcing, you know, sort of um, polarities or anything like that. Um, <coughs> from... And again, I, I, I don't want to say, say I speak for every kanaka or, or anything like that, but from my understanding, the way that I view and engage the world, my, my grandmother was very, we learn about islands and systems, and we think about our, our worldview comes from one that our ancestors could have said, you know, let's just study the ocean and we're going to separate it from the Lo'i Kalo. Um, but we have creation chants that constantly remind us about seeing relationships between things that exist at night and the day, things that are on the mountains and in the ocean. And, and I think really our worldview developed around thinking about relationships between things versus isolating um, them from each other and and our relationships with the natural world or kinship you know I mean I I know for some people that might feel like a stretch um, but um, but we are born of Mother Earth <laughs> we are um, and uh, and so I think that that paradigm enables when we look at the study of systems from a natural science perspective, there is a lot of alignment um, you know, that, that exists there. Um, the kinship part might enable us to take <laughs> the best of science and, and use our ethics to actually infuse it in policy and decision making and, and what we do. And I, and I think that's a very important part. That's, um, again, I'm not trying to be too controversial, but that is a reason why indigenous peoples unfortunately oftentimes have to sacrifice their bodies um, to be heard um, because it means that much, you know. Uh, and, um, and I think that's an important reckoning in some ways um, to, to, to consider. Um, but it's a, it's a bright and hopeful relationship. I, again, I've had I just studied with my, my own lineage and, and not learned with Peter about systems and the ways he's approaching islands, I, a lot would be missed, you know? And, and I think um, perhaps there's reciprocal, and I've seen it with the field school with the students coming out on our Aina 
and, and opening up and engaging and, and um, bringing out new parts of themselves and thinking about their relationships to their own systems and structures when they're home, probably in really different ways. Um, but I think we could write a whole book just on that question in some ways because it's that important, but thank you for that. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And I think that, uh, you know, the I sometimes think that the true beauty of, of traditional knowledge is depth of knowledge of place and uh, deep knowledge of the past. The true beauty of of conventional science is reproducibility and generalizability. And both of those are beautiful things. They're both extremely important to us. Why wouldn't you be better off with both in your toolkit for looking at the world than you are with just one of them? And I think that uh, you know the right relationship between conventional science and traditional knowledge of the world is to stand shoulder to shoulder and look at the world together and try to learn from each other's insights about the world and not stand face to face and evaluate each other because I think that's a dangerous thing to do. Well, one is going to lose if you do that. But if you look at the world together, you're both going to gain from that interaction. Aloha. Um. I have a question about the relationship that you mentioned. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm a first year PhD student here. And last quarter, I was able to TA a course called Planet Ocean. Um, it didn't really have any type of indigenous aspects to it. But since my PI was the course instructor, instructor I was given freedom in creating the curriculum that I wanted to create around um, how can we preserve our oceans? And a big aspect for me was teaching my students how Native Hawaiians and other indigenous communities have a really strong relationship with our aina and our, la our land and our seas, and basically using our systems and our relationship as models for ways that we can perpetuate sustainability. My biggest issue was that some students given that they didn't have that relationship, couldn't understand um, how these systems really worked together. And so my question is, how can you educate people who do not have that relationship about looking at indigenous communities um, to find solutions regarding sustainability? My sense is that when uh, I've taken students to Hawaii and spend time with them there, and Mahina and Keone were both in that course, people uh, learn to appreciate the beauty that's embedded in both the traditional view and uh, conventional science, and see that they can gain from both. And I think a big part of that is meeting people like Kamana, who live in both worlds and uh, are able to be significant players in both worlds. And I, so I think that that is an opportunity to make a real difference in the world. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a really important question, and, and there's so many fronts for that engagement. Um, you know, I, I think about it, as, as you're saying, with these students at, at one level. I also have that same struggle when I was a commissioner on the State Water Resource Management Commission, working with my peers there, some of which who had very different relationships, um, university settings, <laughs> in, in, as a professor, you know, you, you can, so that's a very key and important question that you're kind of honing in on, and, and I, I want to encourage you to just hold that as, as you are engaging in these different fronts, because that's going to be really, really important, and, and the ways in which we tell our stories about our places and how those relationships are developed can can be very inspiring to other people to to connect to their own systems and, and structures and um, when we think about it from a policy perspective for instance um, going out to you know local communities to understand 
the stream biology and the connectivity of Mauka and Makai marine resources, the spawning systems and cycles of reef fish. When you get someone that really has that EK, that knowledge, right, and, and is connected, um, it will greatly inform, you know, policy much better than a bureaucrat, you know, that sits on a board that meets once a month, right, in terms of real understanding of, of how that system works. Um, and, and a part of you, the role, you know, as an intermediary is, is when you're in these boards and other systems is, is translating how much we do know about that, even though that knowledge might be conveyed in different ways than, you know, scientific reports or stream surveys, um, that knowledge is there, right? And, and, um, and it's helped us to manage our resources in, in really abundant ways over generations. So, um, so it takes aloha, it takes patience, it takes grace, um, and, and then humility and just trying to meet people where they're at too. Um, again, I, I've learned so much from, from Peter uh, and, and stretched and pushed my own understanding of things. So it, it can be both ways also. But really, really good question. Okay, mahalo. Um, I, I would love to ask all of the authors of the book um, this question, but, but as, as two people who tried to pull all the different pieces together, um, clearly you, you've learned a lot from each other, but were there any big challenges to bringing the different, slightly different worldviews together in this book? And um, anything that, that was, a, was a struggle for you guys? or individually? <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I thought there, was, there were challenges in uh, worldviews and academics, um, <clears throat> because we certainly had uh, chapters that were written from an experimental point of view science chapters, and we had to integrate them with chapters like Tim Myrie's chapter, which is about how uh, Maori think about the world. And so that was a, that was a difficult thing to do. Um, also, I think that um, we ran into a archaeologist who works in uh, Aotearoa, who's Maori, it turns out. I didn't realize he was Maori before we started this work but who comes from the European tradition of archaeology, which is very formal compared to the tradition of most of the writing in our book. And he was saying, um, please say something in the book about how there are different communities involved in this. And I come from a different community than the people who um, you're drawing upon mostly in this book. Uh, they had, they were much more, uh, people from the American archaeology tradition were much more informal and more narrative in their talking about places. <clears throat> I, you know, I mean, definitely the biggest challenge was just the COVID experience and, um, and trying to write in that period. I, I'm still, yeah, I'm still coming out of that in some ways. <laughs> um, but you know, I think uh, trying to tell a, a more Pacific story um, and and link, you know, ecology and systems, I think, was was a good challenge. Yeah, it was a good challenge. I mean, simple, amazing things, uh, informative things like Epeli Haofa's work. Instead of thinking of islands as you know small islands in a vast sea, think of a sea of islands, and you know, a paci Pacific perspective about connectivity and kanaloa, you know, the ocean not being a boundary, but being a pathway, a, a connector, you know. That's a different kind of approach than when we think about, you know, islands sometimes as, as individual models and stuff. So I think some of that 
integration was really, really fun um, and, and important. Aloha, uh, my name is Rain. Uh, mahalo for your time and for your mana'o. Um, I'm in the law school, I'm a third year, and a lot of the work that I do is run around environmental science and sharing the stories of islands. I think for me, um, one of the challenges I have sort of bridging off of you know, my friend's question here is also how do you translate that to the legal policy side? Mm -hmm. um, I saw that mm -hmm. Kumo Mehana was in there. I know she's done a lot of great work on this in Kauai. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if there's any interesting research or discoveries during the collection of this book that you thought could have really good insights for legal transformation as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, y you know, in, in Hawaii, because of the complexity of our history and successive governments, uh, um, you know, we, we do have the benefit of traditional customary practice and some of these things that were enshrined during the period of the Hawaiian Kingdom around resource management and access and, um, and rights um, that at least in, in the Hawaii state system, um, we've been able to, to advance. And that's kind of the work that we do at Kahuliao, Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law, is, is really trying to um, train our students to understand you know, these sets of Kanaka rights and, and issues um, that, that stem from um, these earlier structures. Um, so when you think of, in, in Hawaii's context, you know, um, common law doesn't uh, apply if, if Hawaiian traditional and custom are, are distinct and different. We'll go back to that. And so that's a real resource for us when it comes to documenting traditional rights and practices. So <coughs> those fishing management practices that I just mentioned in the earlier question are all a part of traditional customary rights. And so sometimes when we look at um, <coughs> arguing specific cases or, or even management decisions on commissions in Hawaii that, that have an obligation to protect the public trust, of which part of it is traditional customary rights, we can draw upon those knowledge systems to make better decisions in policy. And I mean, let's see, I'm off the Water Commission now. I did two terms in eight years, so sway some of my colleagues to make better decisions also. Um, and so tho those are s some of the efforts, I think, you know, that you might be able to get from this book and others. Um, yeah, but really good question. <laughs> Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, the most recent um, eruptions on the big island of the volcano there, do you feel like that is um, related to current changes uh, with, uh, with the world, uh, with climate change, or do Native folks generally feel like that's connected lately, or, or are they considered just a, a fairly, that, that's happening a normal amount right now, mm. or does it seem like it's extreme right now? Mm. Oh, and also one more question. Do you feel like there's any pro any possibility, uh, or I should ask, are there any projects on Kahulave, and or do you feel like it's at all realistic to ever consider projects over there? Mm. <coughs> yeah. Do you want me to start, Peter? You want to? Go ahead. Yeah. So um, in many ways, Tutu Pele is kind of, she's always been going, <laughs> and there's action there, and um, and it's amazing, you know, it's, it's uh, being up and close, you know, to that experience, seeing that ena ena. When I was, uh, the first time I saw Tutu Pele, um, I smelt her first, and I was about maybe 10 or 11, 12, something like that. I was at my grandmother's house, uh, my Tutu's house, and Kalapana was burning, and she got a friend to get like a VW bus and we went out in the middle of the night, and I remember before we got there, just that smell, that, you know, the, the burning and um, the sulfur. And then I saw the, the red glow, you know, coming down. And, um, and there's a chant that my tutu would do. And so it talks about the way that the lava flows. It, it's noke. Like nothing can stop lava where it's going, right? And and she said when we we're looking at that Anna Anna, that's like that's how we have to be in our family is to be like the Pele. Nothing can stop us with what we're doing. 
And, um, and so that's a huge part, especially of Hawaii Island families, um, I think many, is, is that relationship to Tutupele. It is pretty remarkable. I've never seen Tutupele just recently, the Mauna Loa eruption from my house in Waimea. Mauna Kea was glowing, drove up Kohala Mountains. I could see, I mean, it was, it was amazing, stunning. Um, so some people see that as a huliao, as, as another sign and, you know, something to consider around the changes that are happening in Hawaii and in other places. Um, so that, but I, you know, these recent activities um, are incredible to witness, for sure. Um, did I get your? I'm Kolave, yes. So, yeah, there's a lot of work happening on Kolave, Protect Kolave, Ohana, um, you know, still active and, and stewarding that place. Um, there are, you know, different projects that kind of happen there, and a whole gang of friends, some of which opened our last book talk. Um, the Baker Ohana um, are really, really involved in that. So yeah, there's still a lot of projects going on there. Um, but difficult to clean up a live fire training um, that took place on the bombing of that island. Um, and uh, so, yeah. yeah. I think the challenge in Kaholavi is restoration. And, yeah, it's a very difficult challenge, but I think it's the first challenge before anything else can be done that's useful there. Mahalo. I was wondering if you could each talk about who your ideal audience is for this book. As you think about who you would most like to read it, uh, what kinds of profiles of people and how you might reach some of them. Thank you. You want to start? Okay. Yeah, yeah I would love to see uh, Students, um, like the people who were at our last event in Hawaii, um, read the book. Native students who are Maori or Hawaiian, because they would recognize that there are things that they know that uh, can make a difference in the world. And I think that uh, making that difference in the world is the crucial thing that we all need to see going forward. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think um, there's a whole generation of students that um, I hope this book can help to empower and advance, um, and they can build off of it and, and take it even in further generations. And I also hope it's an intervention in, into the world of science um, and, and how we consider our, our activities and relationships with, with the planet. Um, as well as with policymakers um, that um, we struggle to, <laughs> on both sides, to, to make the right decisions. So. I was impressed in the uh, field course that there were several people who were saying, look, if you're doing what the uncles say and you're doing what the scientists say, you're probably doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they're both saying the same thing, you're, and that's what you're doing, that's probably the right thing to do. Yeah. 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 I think that's true. Um, mahalo for your time. Um, I was hoping to ask, kind of based off questions that have been asked before, about um, reaching audiences that don't have the same cultural background um, or the same cultural ties. Um, like the cultural ideas about relationships to land and how and what lessons they might get about sustainability um, from the book or from from like island cultures. Mm. You know, I, I think one of the things that I've found most interesting in the field course I teach is that uh, there comes a time about two thirds of the way through the course where several students will approach me about in the same week and say, Okay, now I know more about Hawaii than I know about my place. And that's not right. I should know more about my place. And you go, yeah, right on. That's that's what I'm trying to do here. You know, because your place is beautiful and your place has a lot to say to the world. So you need to know your place. Like you now know Hawaii. Yeah, I, th I think just the insight 
of the difference between lan and aina. So aina in our, in our language, ai means to, to eat, to consume. And, and when you add that na, it turns it kind of into a noun. So, so land is, for us, is, is that which feeds, is the literal translation. Um, and that means more than just physical land or, or physical feeding. Um, it includes, you know, metaphysical and um, emotional relationships that come from our land, <laughs> you know, and it feeds us um, physically and, and spiritually. So those subtle distinctions of, of just something as simple as land, think of how often we use that term, right? And, and it's usually related to exclusive use and, and fee and, you know, economic development and gain, and those are all parts of maybe how we view land. But is there space to think about it, that which feeds us again? You know, and what does that mean for all of us as people, as humans, on, in the time that we face today? So. I wanted to say that Pamela <laughs> is the uh, first author of one of the chapters of the book on sustainability, and I think it's a very important and fundamental chapter because it uh, puts the island views of sustainability in the context of global views about sustainability and vice versa, which is, I think, crucial. Kamana was an author of that as well, and uh, K.O. Duarte was an author of that as well. And uh, the blending of worldviews that's in there is, I think, uh, a good example for what we all need going forward. All righty. Um, not really a question, more of a comment. I remember Noah Lincoln sitting right there, and he was talking about pre-Captain Cook, the Hawaiian Islands had more people and they were self-sufficient. Today, there are fewer people, and a vast majority of the food is flown in. And so there's an incredibly important traditional knowledge that's been lost. So thank you for the book and uplifting that and bringing it back. Mahalo. Yeah, thank you. Mahalo. All right, before we break for a little socializing and some appetizers, um, do you have any closing words to share with us? Well, we're happy to sign copies of the book for anyone who wants to do that. <laughs> book for sale here with, from the bookstore, so please um, take a look at it. And then join us for some socializing, chat with our authors, and ask any more further questions you might have. And on behalf of the Woods Institute, thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much to the Native American Cultural Center for co-hosting with us. It's been a pleasure having all of you here. Thank you.